My name's Sasha P and I'm joined by a fantastic individual. This man scored goals for fun. I remember him dazzling defences both at Sydney Olympic and West Adelaide. He's also worn the green and gold, none other than the great Pablo Cardozo. Thanks, Pablo, for joining today. <laughs> Thanks, mate. No, nice intro and yeah, no, happy to be here, mate. All good. So tell us, Pablo, how did you fall in love with our great game? It's not hard from my background, you know. Obviously, we've been born in Argentina, having crazy football-loving parents, uncles, aunties, the whole lot, you know. Um, it's it's impossible not to. Um, you grow up, you know, with that. that It's already in your blood. It's it's just in your DNA. It's, it's there from day one. Um, and as much as, you know, people don't like to say it, it's, it, you're either born loving it or born able to play it or not, um, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, definitely, um, the old man from a very young age started taking me out the backyard and, and kicking the ball around and he used to play locally and every Saturday afternoon we'd be down there and from all stories, uh, I get told from people that I bump into that played along with him or, um, that were there, um, obviously older adults. Um, they say to me, oh, we remember you kicking the ball into the goals by yourself at halftime after the game. You know, you always kick with the ball in your hand. You never went anywhere without it. Um, you didn't go up on the on the slippery slides and slide down with the ball under your arm, that kind of thing. Um, mm. It's probably something you don't see nowadays, I guess. But um, that's that's basically where it all started, the family at home. Um, obviously, we don't have the luxury, or well, we didn't have the luxuries back then of the internet and, and cable TV and all that where you could watch football for fun. But So a lot of that just came naturally, I guess, because it was – a different era back in the 70s and, and early 80s where you didn't have any of that, where you, football was only watched live in front of you, not so much on TV um, or on the internet. So, yeah, that's where it all began. And uh, tell us about your first junior club. When, when did you start playing for a team? I didn't actually start playing until I was 11. I um, mm -hmm. actually wanted to be a tennis player. <laughs> um, I was, I think, nine, and the tennis coach said to me, oh, you're a brilliant tennis player, but you're too little. Um, cop that in football as well, which is kind of <laughs> random. Um, but, yeah, it was just told you're too little. The old man was buzzing because he didn't want me to play tennis. He wanted to play football. So between 9 and 11, I didn't play. Um, but when I turned 11, my dad took me to a club in, in Maroubra called Brothers. Um, I think that's what they were called, Brothers Soccer Club. Um, and that's where I first played my games. Uh, first ever time I ever put... Well, apart from school soccer, um, you know, primary school soccer, that was probably the only time I ever, yeah, put on a pair of boots. Um, there was always just kicking around the backyard barefoot or sneakers. So, um, yeah, that's 11 years old was when I first started with that team called Brothers. And then uh, when I went to, when I turned 12, went to the Spanish club, which was ironically the team that the old man used to play for. Mm -hmm. um, Spanish club of Sydney, which unfortunately no longer exists, but um, was a great um upbringing a great uh environment kind of like you know you've got the croatian clubs the greek clubs you know they all merged there we were latino we didn't have latino clubs so the closest thing to us was a spanish club european spanish so that's where it all uh kicked off from there and then after a, a year there um because i lived in marrickville in new south wales so i was on the eastern suburbs away from all the big clubs the, the marconi's the sydney croatia's of those days um, the only team around then, back then, was Sydney City. So mm -hmm. my first big club was uh, Sydney City, the original Sydney City at under-13s. And they had a fantastic pedigree, obviously, um, and during that time they still would have had uh, a, a senior squad that would, you know, would be largely made up of Socceroos. Um, <clears throat> talk to me about the expectation of playing for Sydney City as a junior, did, were, were they also elite at the junior ranks or was, was that? Yeah, definitely. No, we were we were consistently at the top. Um, I remember you'd, you'd always be, I think from memory back then, it's a long time ago, I'm nearly 50. Um, <laughs> um, so back then you had two groups. So we were always in the second group for some reason. I don't know why. Um, we'd always be top one or two. Um, we'd always pretty much get to the Champions of Champions and we'd always come up against Marconi, mm -hmm. uh, Sydney, Croatia, one of those teams that were always 
the top teams out west. So it must have been an out west and east comp um, mm. back then growing up. Again, I don't remember the structure of it, but that's kind of roughly what it was. But we were always competitive, always top two, always winning. Um, we had awesome um, people running the, the juniors back then. Um, and, yeah, like you said, the, the, Nash, the, the top National League team for Sydney City had Murray Barnes, Frank Farinas, you know, all these kinds of guys, you know, playing playing their first grade. And we we we'd be asked to be ball boys every other every mm. game here and there. And and at ES Marksfield, where it was a grandstand on one side, um, change rooms opposite, and then a running track. We were always on the running track, sitting there watching the game, being ball boys at you know thirteen. And you know, uh, when when I remember one game we played, they played against Olympic. And um, it was just crazy. It was like 5,000 Olympic fans and your 35 you know, <laughs> city fans that they had. And they, some Olympic supporter just picked up this massive bin and threw it over the edge and landed about 10 metres away from us where we were standing. It was kind of, kind of like an oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. moment there that was like, eh, uh, but that was part of the atmosphere and it made it, it made it really, really cool and kind of drove that adrenaline as a kid seeing the soccer is those soccer players up close, you know, they had Jerry Gomez was playing, um, mm. Pizano, I think, was in goals. Um, yeah, Murray Barnes. Uh, it's just a plethora of soccer in yeah, that team. John Cosmina. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I think oh, Joe Joe Watson. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, you know, guys like that. It was just, yeah, yeah, beasts of those eras, you know, mm. the, the legends of that era and superstars mm. of that era. We were there you know, so close to them. And then, um, but yeah, it was juniors. And then we'd go and play Champions of Champions at the end of the year. And we'd come up against a Marconi who on the opposite team would have the Paul Oak on, mm. a David Seal, uh, mm. you know, players like that who were just, you know, brilliant back then already. Um, Bosnich and goals, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so it was just, it was just that era of, you know, and then, you know, you fast track forward, you know, 15, 16 years and they're all, you know, superstars. Um, you know, so it's kind of like you grew up in that in that sort of uh, uh, golden era, really. I think at the end of it, it was a golden era. The um, in your in your senior career, you you scored many many goals. Did did you gravitate to the front of the pitch uh, as a junior? No. So I I grew up being a, a midfielder, so I was basically a number eight, um, and the old man used to. One thing you always taught me was technical, technical stuff. So it was never anything athletic. It was all get the ball, work off the wall. So we'd have a wall in our backyard, the back, back of the units where we used to live in, and it was just constantly pounding the ball against that wall and the re, the rebounding, the control, the first touch. And you know, I I got to give thanks to the old man because I think one thing I definitely had, you know, pretty good was the first touch. So I think mm. that was um, something that that really helped me as I got older. And even as a, as a junior, you know, you, back in those days, it wasn't as clean as it is now where you're not allowed mm. to touch anyone. Now, back then you'd get creamed at every touch. And if you didn't have a good touch, you know, it was just smash. So, mm. um, but yeah, definitely. I grew up probably playing as a midfielder most of my, my life. I think I didn't really start playing up front until I was, well, consistently up front until I was probably 17, 18. Mm-hmm. Um, I was always, a, I think I was always a, that kind of false nine. So, mm-hmm. you know, we'd always, back in those days, it was always 4 4 2, basically, um, or 4 3 3. In, in, we were ahead of our time, those, those teams that played 4 3 3. Um, and it was just that constant, you know, I'd start up front, but always end up in the middle. Kind of mm-hmm. how I played my, my senior football. Mm-hmm. Um, never changed pretty much. And, and yeah, and that, that midfield uh, development that I had helped me when I went up front because it, I was able to control the ball and not, you know, not not be uncomfortable on the ball where you kind of see a lot of strikers who are just strikers who are good finishers but mm. don't always look that good on the ball and, and comfortable. Mm. And I think that's really, really helped me when I was growing up. It's fascinating that you say that the, that the wall becomes a very good teacher, you know, pounding that ball against the wall. Yeah. Um, and so many great players have made the wall and the ball their friends. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's interesting that in today's time of young junior development that uh, we've moved from this 
everything seems to be organised play, right? So for yep. a kid to to go out on a soccer uh, pitch, they, the parents need to go and spend, you know, two hundred dollars to for to, to enrol them in a you know four hour session or a, mm-hmm. you know in, into a team. So um, interesting point for for kids watching or parents um, maybe that could encourage their their kids to make the ball and the wall their friend. Yeah, and I was the, lucky enough. Sorry, to, sorry, to I was lucky enough that. My old man was so passionate about the game that he was taking me to a park as well down in Maryville um, that had this wall. On one side, it was a concrete where players would go play tennis up on one side and the other side was grass and the wall. And he painted the goalpost with the right width. He painted little top corner, bottom corner. And when we'd go down for a kick, you know, back then, it was, you know, graffiti wasn't probably illegal. <laughs> um, so he went down, painted that when we were there one day. And, and then, yeah, we'd always be down there and, you know, half a dozen balls and I just constantly aiming for those bottom corners, top corners, left foot, right foot. And, you know, I grew up being a right footer, but by the time I was 15, 16, no one could tell that I was unnaturally not a left footer um, because I was constantly using the left foot when, when needed and able to, able to play with my left foot. I mean, I, I tore my groin um, playing for Parramatta Power in, in senior football. And when I came back, I was told not to, not to push it for the first three weeks of training until I built up a bit of strength in the leg, but I used my left foot the whole time. So, <laughs> so it was kind of like that kind of mm. thing where I could do that because of that training and, and, and junior things that I did as a kid. And testament to your dad, obviously, he, he, would, uh, <clears throat> he would be a reason that um, you developed as a footballer because he had the insight. He'd already played football at a at an okay level for you to instruct you what the hmm. what the appropriate way uh, is to play. Can you touch on that? Yeah, look, I mean, obviously he grew up in Uruguay. He played a lot of junior football over there and he played a lot of, um, I don't think he ever made it to the le- the heights mm. that he probably could have um, had he stayed in, in South America. Um, but having said that, you know, he, he already had that knowledge, you know, and mm. that's one thing, you know, you can have all this book smarts of in football and be – you know, um, qualified, mm. but if you actually can't demonstrate something and you actually can't mm. show a kid how to position their body, how to use their arms, how to stand, how to, you know, turn their body one way or another to, to control a ball, mm. um, you, can, you can be the most qualified coach in the world, but mm. I, I want to see what you're doing. Yeah. If I'm doing it wrong, I want you to show me how it's been done wrong. And mm. I feel that that's a lot of that has been lost over the last sort of decade. Mm. Um, we've got a lot of qualified coaches, but not a lot of quality. Coaches. Yeah, yeah, quality. Yeah, <laughs> um, qualified yeah. versus quality. Yeah, yeah. Understood. And I think, and I think, um, and yeah, that his up- upbringing, and again, you know, you grow up over there playing in the streets twenty four hours a day. It's it's one of those things where you know you're watching every day. They're superstars of their eras. Um, you know, they they, they cross the. the the river an hour on the on a ferry and they're in Argentina they can watch any game over there um so you know for him he brought that and, and instilled it in me and my brother and and I feel that we both benefited from that technically a lot and yeah I think that's that's definitely um that definitely helped both of us in our in our footballing ability that's for sure talk to me when you made your senior debut it was um unexpected um oh, in a way, it was unexpected. I was only 17, um, a couple of months before my 18th birthday. And I had a pretty good, you know, junior, you know, after Sydney City, you went on to Sydney, um, to Canterbury District. So I played at Canterbury District for you. That, then under 15, I went to Olympic. So I was fif- just turning 15 when I went and trialled with Sydney Olympic and and pretty much got signed after a, a, a week of trialling. I mean, nowadays, I think they do it all in one day here in New South Wales. I don't know what it's like everywhere else. But here in New South Wales, you go trials, it's on that day and everyone hosts the trials on that day. And if you're not there, you don't, you can't go to another club. Back then, you had about a month to trial. If you didn't make that first cut, you can go to another club next week and, and the following week. And so you had a few opportunities, which is kind of weird now. I don't know how they do that. But um, I went, yeah, from 15, under 16s, then it changed. Um, when I was meant to be under 16s, it went to 15, 17s. So I was 16 playing on... Um, 15 playing under 17s and then 16s playing under 18s. So it was, it was a big gap because, you know, an under 18 and first graders dropping, it was big boys and, you know, and I wasn't the biggest guy 
you know, even even as senior football, I wasn't the tallest guy. So, you know, I'm I'm there playing under 18s and and doing quite well. Um, and then I get a tap on the shoulder from the youth team coach, and and at the time it was um, first grade coach was Mick Hickman, yeah. and and he said, um, as of next week, you're not training with the youth team anymore. You're coming up and training with us. And I was like, why? <laughs> My first thing thought was why what have I done wrong but they've said no you come and train first grade and and within six months I was yeah making my debut against Sunshine George Cross at St George Stadium just before a couple of months before my 18th birthday so um it was yeah it was such a quick transition from 15 to 18 um that it just went just flew it just felt like it was a year but it was three nearly three um you know, it was, it was an incredible period, yeah. And talk to me about who were the, the leaders in that group, uh, the, the people that were established. We're, we're talking about around 1990 now? Is that It was 1990, the, yeah. Yeah. It was 1990, so I was already training with most of those guys from about early 89. So a lot of those guys were still like your Andrew Bernals, your yeah. Robbie Ironsides, your Abbasards, Grant Lee, Robbie Hooker. Um, Gary Meyer, Clint Gosling, um, John Kosh, I believe, was there. Um, I think Riscopolis might have been there. Mm. Um, I'm just trying to think of that team that won the grand final that year. Alistair Edwards. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was just, it was just, yeah, it was a plethora of, of, of big names of that era. Um, and also just, a lot of key there was a couple of Kiwi internationals. Obviously, Robbie Einside was a Kiwi captain, mm. I believe, at the time. Mm. Um, Andrew Bernal was in the Socceroos. You know, we just just a great team, um, a strong team. And they 1990 they ended up winning it. So mm. you know, to be you know part of that that group was was unreal. Um, and I was mm. still a baby, basically, <laughs> um, mm. in footballing terms. So um, it was it was really good. <laughs> Um, got the little one woke up. <laughs> um, yeah, so it was kind of like that era that was really, really busy and, and strong, and um, and it felt really good being being successful at that time, at that age, so so quickly. Talk to me about because you would have played uh, plenty, sort of uh, half the side attackers versus defenders. <laughs> and uh, would have had plenty of 50-50 challenges with the, the likes of an Andy Bennell, uh, who, by all reports, a very intimidating character on the pitch. Uh, I remember him saying saying how he would coach young boys to, to step on other people's uh, toes in the in, in, on, a, on a corner. So um, was he hard at training? Well, that was already happening a year before that, because we'd play, I think one night a week, we'd always play the first graders starting and against the youth team. So okay. if they ever needed any extra numbers, they'd call up a couple of boys from the youth team. So most of the times it'd be me and a couple of other boys, regulars. Um, and obviously I was playing up front by then and getting marked by him and Spiri Dacos, who were both, you know, this big. Um, and I remember the first tackle, the balls come into my feet and I just saw these, these studs this big and I'm training on pretty much a concrete ground come through and just clean me up from behind. It was just like nothing I expected before. And then just like he said, get up. <laughs> That's all he said. He said, get up. And I was like, yeah, no worries. Good. Um, so, yeah, so first two or three balls were just like bang and then an elbow to the back of the neck. And it was just a constant, just constant hits that were just like back then in those first, 10 minutes of that I was just like oh this is um this is not the way it should be done but you know mm. fast track to now the, the way I see things are just so nice and so easy for younger mm. players I feel like it, it toughened us up a lot quicker um and mm. it also made us think so if you were smart enough you knew what to do next and and I remember yep. that you know after about 15 20 minutes of the game you know he, he, a couple of those those tackles went through and then I think there was one time where I, I sort of knew he was coming, so I just flicked it around one way, went the other way, mm. <laughs> and he goes, "Well done, son." Mm. <laughs> so yeah, made him made him sort of think twice about 
trying to dive in on, on me too quickly, but I was a lot sharper and a lot quicker back then, so I was able to do it. But yeah, um, yeah, it was it was it was a really good learning curve really quickly and um, something that yeah, it was very. I think I think it was beneficial to all of us younger guys coming through. <laughs> the um, so it, it's not the first time um, that you, you you played at at Sydney Olympic and sort of Sydney Olympic. If if I if I think of you, I. I, I you spent time at, at numerous clubs, um, but I, I, I remember um, it was probably that weaving in and out of Sydney Olympic um, that sort of locks my mind into you associating with that club and, and maybe m- more than any other. Is that, looking back at your career, would you, would you say that that's, that's a fair assessment because the, the amount of times that you went back to Olympic? It was kind of like my home, really. Like, mm. you know, a lot of boys, you know, have their the Marconis where they played from 13s all the way to first grade and then went overseas. Or Sydney Croatia, like a lot of your, you know, your Pobovichs and your mm. and your Kalatas and all those that, you know, started in those those clubs as juniors and then went all the way through. Um, it, it was kind of like the same for me. Um, I guess it might have been different if it's Sydney City not been, yep. uh, Dis- you know, disbanded. kicked out or disbanded, yep. yeah. Um, might have been Sydney City, but it ended up being Olympic for me. Um, so probably that. I think when I left at 20, just before my 21st, um, it was only because of opportunities. Um, obviously, they'd, they'd signed a whole heap of strikers and, and I had no hope of starting. And then the coach, I think, at the time was Mariani and he just mm. obviously brought in his, the guy that he wanted and it was a footballing thing and totally understood. And I had to do something to, to get out. And lucky enough for me, Raul Blanco came calling and in West Adelaide. So, you know, had I been an Adelaide boy, West Adelaide would have been my team. So, you know, they 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 did everything for me. And I think that was a the platform where I was able to probably develop the most. Um, whilst the Olympic I was succeeding, it was mainly probably within. Um, I think at West Adelaide I had, you know, your Raul Blanco there and and obviously him being part of the national team set up was different ideas different mentalities living at a home as well away from mum and dad and and you know you're having your your breakfast and your lunches and your dinners made for you where you had to just fend for yourself at you know 19 20 back in those days was wasn't probably as normal as it is now um but that was that was probably the best thing that happened to me at the time because four and a half years later i got to go to europe so um you know that was where where it all happened and you're you're living away from home, so you're getting that taste um, for being a, um, a, a professional. Obviously, uh, football is the, the vast majority of your life, um, and so I assume my, my assumption is that you dedicated all of your time to, to playing football for West Adelaide. Um, talk to me about the mentality um, of Rail Blanco, because so many players who played underneath him have got very, very uh, high regards for his coaching mentality. Tell me what he was like as a coach. Well, as a young boy, we, there was a few of us. There was myself, Jimmy Tekenis, um, Frank Tiboldi, and uh, Richie Allegich. So there's a few boys here um, that sort of around that 19, 20, 21 year old that we probably mentally developed a lot quicker because of his sternness, basically. He was really, it was quite hard on us, to be fair. But mm. But it was good. It was it, it, at the time we were like really, we probably hated him for it at the time because mm-hmm. he was quite so, you know, old school basically. And it was mm-hmm. just like my way or the highway. And, you know, really got up you if you did the wrong thing. Um, and every Monday, first training after the game, if someone did something wrong, everyone would be looking at each other going, who's copping it tonight? So mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's one of those where it, it really developed us mentally. Um, and I think the two years that I had him as coach was, was brilliant and and also his international experience he he brought with us stories and, and information that that helped us on the pitch and and at training um uh, the last year we had him i think in the off season he went and spent about a uh, three weeks or two or three weeks in barcelona and used their training camp and methods over there and brought him back to us and we went from doing these crazy long runs in pre-season to barely doing a 4k run um, in the last season he was there. And I think that, and we just did everything with the ball. Everything was fitness with the ball, probably the way it should have been. <laughs> but it just, 
obviously expanded his mind and also us and made us even better. And technically, West Adelaide always was a good footballing side. It was just, we just didn't make the, 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 that next step they needed and probably because of the, the amount of younger players we had. Um, mm. But it was that kind of thing where it was definitely, um, it was a definitely great experience having, having Raul Blanco as one of their coaches. You see, you, you played well over 100 games from memory for, for West Adelaide and you, you probably scored a, a goal every other game. Um, are there any any in particular that sort of stand out for you that um, goals or games that you played for West Adelaide that um, that uh, stick in, in, your, in your mind? Oh, the Adelaide derbies. There's nothing better. There was nothing better. Um, you know, we had Sydney derbies and we had, you know, I'm sure the Melbourne derbies are great as well, but the Adelaide derby being that Hindmarsh was such a small mm-hmm. stadium um, mm-hmm. and it was pre what it is now, how, how nice mm-hmm. it looks. Um, you had people just standing in the aisles and mm-hmm. it was shoulder to shoulder. It wasn't like, you know, the aisles were empty and there was a seat here and there. It was packed throughout every seat, packed around mm-hmm. the aisles. There was people still outside trying to get in and those derbies were intense. They were like unreal. They were... You know, they say that there was never really big crowds in those leagues and our league back in the NSL, but we had some really good crowds there and here in Sydney as well with, with Olympic and, and those sort of teams. And it was, it was, I think the stadium fit officially 14,000, but I'm sure there was probably 18. Mm. <laughs> um, and and scoring scoring a couple of goals in those in those derbies was, was pretty good. Uh, one in particular, I remember um, where Stanley's Reedies was there and, um, yeah, it was just a great, great build-up, great layoff, and I beat a couple of players and curled it in the bottom corner. It was, it was one of those where it was just, yeah, just, and you were the king of the town for the for that week, you know. Mm-hmm. After, because you know, you could walk down Hine, uh, Hindmarsh or Hindley Street, Hindley Street, know, Hindley Street, yeah, Hindley Street, where all the cafes are down there, yeah, and yeah. And, um, and you know, every second cafe was run by an Italian, and you walk past yeah. and you just go, "How you doing?" <laughs> yeah. And it was, you know, they'd be like, "Oh, we'll get you next game." But it was good. It was a small city, but the rivalry was unreal. And mm. yeah, Adelaide City has some phenomenal players, and probably one of the ones mm. I learned most. You know, you you learn off a lot of players that you play with or train with. But I think I learned a lot playing against Ivanovic mm-hmm. um, because he just knew how to. Being that he's come from, you know, the the, the where he came from, Yugoslavia, he the he's he knew how to put his arm on a on a defender on a striker to put him off. So you'd stand, and he, he knew how to just give you just a little touch to nudge you off the ball, and he'd come through and take you, take the ball off you. It was just so quickly when you're playing against people that experience, and again, how many games did he play for the Socceroos as well? That was kind of like where I went, okay, now I know if I'm playing against the, sec- the best defender in the league or one of the best defenders in the league mm. every other week because we'd play them, you know, in local cup games and mm. mm-hmm. national cup games and league games. Um, pre-season games, we'd, we'd constantly be playing against him and you'd constantly, constantly come up against him. Mm. And it was him and Alex Tobin and both of them mm. were the two main starters of the national team. Yes. So it was just, you know, the, the experience that you get out of that, it just makes, it just makes you a better player, um, yes. you know. And for me, I learned as much playing against him as I mm. did playing with some great players. Mm. 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 Yeah, very... And... and- Arguably, um, one of the, the, the better set of halves that has put on a, a soccer jersey. Mm. So, uh, how how did you make your way off uh, overseas? Because it was from from West Adelaide that that you, you, you touched on it briefly before that that you got that opportunity to go overseas. So, how how did that come about? Um, it was it was pretty sudden as well. I think. A lot of the, even actually the first two years in, in Adelaide, I was playing a lot of midfield. Mm. So I didn't really got to play where I wanted to play. Because um, by then I was already, well, I wanted to play up front. So I, I knew that I could play as that false nine a lot of the game, a lot of the teams. And we'd always have that bigger, stronger striker next to you in the in the systems we used to play back then. Um, so played a lot of midfield. So it was, I was scoring 10 goals, 12 goals, you know, still scoring a few goals, but from midfield. Um but then the last year and a half, um, Raul left and Adrian Santrek took over and he just said, okay, well, you know, I'm going to change the system a bit. I'm going to play you as, as a forward. And um, just before I left, I was already on 11 goals in 12 games. So, um, and that was my first full real foray into playing up front for, 
for mm. West Adelaide. And 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 that year, um, I can't remember what the agent's name was, just gave me a call and said, oh, Rapid Vienna is interested. Do you, do you want to go? And at the time, I was like, oh, maybe let me finish the season. But that was, I left in in January. So um, left a 40-degree summer in Adelaide to a minus five Vienna so, <laughs> um, with knee-high snow. So um, it just came out of, out of nowhere, really. But obviously, mm. performances leading up to that were – were pretty good and 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 got me to where where I needed to be and um, unfortunately back in those days, what would be the difference in the quality of the football? Let's say NSL versus now you you're now playing for a, a decent club in a in a one of the decent leagues in uh, in Europe. Oh, it's it's dog eat dog. Like it's it's mm. you're not performing at training you're not going to play. And the next guy is coming to take your spot. And you as a foreigner are coming to take a local spot. So it was, wasn't – here it was, it's – oh, yeah, he's all right. He's my mate. Yeah, he's all right. And back over there, it's just like you, if you don't perform, if you're not on your game every training session, you're not going to play. And you're going to be on the next plane. So um, it was it was an eye-opener straight up. Um, everyone was really – friendly and, and welcoming and all the rest of it. Um, but I was playing at the biggest club in, in Austria. You know, Rabbit Vienna is arguably the biggest club in Austria in, in, with history. Um, only now you got your Red Red Bull, you know, because mm. of money mm. and all that. And Rapids sort of dropped a little bit, a few levels, but um, still in the top tier, but dropped in terms of being the mm. champions regularly. Um, and it was everyone's touch is, is, is smarter, is quicker, is... Mm. You know, your defenders can actually play. Um, the midfielders are strong, fit. You know, they're just physically, you know, a lot of it's a German mentality as well because, you know, Austrians and Germans are very similar um, in terms of their mentality. Um, and and the football was was very strong, very solid. And it, 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 I had to really adapt to it quickly. Um, again, lucky at the time that I was able to play in a position where I felt comfortable. And then, unfortunately, the coach that I had got sacked and the new guy that came in wasn't very uh, welcoming to my to my style of play. And uh, it started playing me out wide on the left, out wide on the right, and then it's not my game. Um, mm. did, did as best as I could, but then ended up pretty much bench. And then the last two or three games, I wasn't even in the squad. So, you know, mm. it went from being really great to... You know, a change of coach made made a massive difference to my my time there, and um, I, I believe I was doing well enough to stay um, uh, to get an extra three years uh, as the deal was made. Um, but had I been given that chance, I, I think I probably would have probably never have come back to Australia. I mm. think uh, my career would have gone way higher um, in terms of progression. I think probably. My own decision in in staying here after I came back was was probably where it led my to not going to probably where the heights I should have gone. Mm. And it's interesting. It's it's uh, coming back is where um, it's your time back at, at Olympic after uh, being in Austria, where you, you're scoring really in that time goals for fun um, and. <clears throat> So now we're, we're, we're talking, uh, I think, uh, just before the year 2000 is like a 99. 90, 90, 98. 98, 99, uh, <laughs> 2000. So, um, yeah, talk to me. Who are the, who are the, uh, the players in that uh, Sydney Olympic squad? Because so it's already, it's, it's almost been a, a decade in between, right? So uh, it's uh, seven or eight years Um that uh, so, so yeah, six, six, seven, eight years, depending on when the time that you leave. Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> so who are the who are the faces in the change rooms now at Olympic? Um, it was a bit different. It was obviously a lot of those boys had gone from my from that other time, um, whether retired or, or moved on. Um, hmm. When I've come back, that that was I think it was the first year that also Branko Kalina took over. So he brought in a lot of guys from external clubs, from other clubs, and. There was only a handful of guys that were Olympic boys, you know, your, your Peter Sikanis's, um, yeah, Nicky Carl was still there, 
Um, there was a couple of other guys that were there, um, but then he brought in Jason Chalina, you know, Scott Thomas. Um, I think from memory, Aaron Basic came that year, if I'm not mistaken. But, you know, you had Brett Emerton. Um, you, you had some some really good footballers in that team as well. Um, Chris Colansis was there. Mm. Um, again, out of probably a, as an Olympic fan, um, that would be – he would be my – Number one, like Chris mm. Glantz was technically, you could do anything with a ball. Like you know, I, I used to love playing with him because you know, I'd make a run and I wouldn't even have to look and I knew the ball was coming right at mm. my feet. Mm. Um, it, it, players like that and and it was it was it was a good footballing side. Um, probably deserved a lot more recognition that it got that year, ninety mm. eight. Um, but it was a year, like you said, I was I came back and. I scored 18 goals, top score of the league, um, mm. but we didn't even make the six. <laughs> mm. So, you know, you generally, generally nowadays, your, your top scorer is a team that, the, the guy from the top team. Mm. Um, you don't get many guys that stand out in a team that doesn't make the six. And, and mm. for me to, to be the top scorer in that team and, and the league in arguably, you know, depends who you talk to, a, a stronger competition. Um, mm. uh, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't a bad feat to come back and do that. Mm. Um, and then the years, as the following years came on, you know, the, the following year, I, I think I scored 21. The year after that, I scored another, I think, 18. So, yeah, it was kind of, like you're saying, it was pretty pretty successful in, in my scoring. Um, mm. But we had some great players in those teams as well. You know, Chichi Mendes, mm. um, Kresimir Marisic, uh, mm. you know, um, it was just a, a squad of great footballers. Um, Hunter Juric was there. Clint Bolton was in goals. Yeah. We just had some some outstanding footballers. And it was teams that Lindsay Wilson, who went, went and signed with PSV, um, it, 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 was, it, was, it was a great, great squad. The, um, and Troy the, Halpin. The, Jesus, yes. I can't remember that name. Troy Halpin. <laughs> The the um, so Chris Kalansis uh, coming back to Olympic. I remember watching him uh, play in, um, in in Athens, um, and so he, he's he's played at you know a first eleven player that you know both at Panathinaikos course and Olympia course uh, his time there in the in the mid nineties um, to come back to Olympic. He, so he would have added a lot of quality. He, he, he just said. Um, uh, Chris um, Borusic, quality, quality midfielder. So, and likes, uh, you said, you know, Jason Kalina, Brett Ebert, and we know what they did for the Socceroos. So, um, Branko Kalina, talk to me about his mentality. What what are the things that he uh, would uh, focus on uh, at your time at Olympic? He wanted to play good football. And, mm. and you look at all these teams, they always did. Um, mm. You know, that, that successful Sydney United team from... A couple of years before that, they they smashed every club. They only lost to Brisbane in the final. Um, mm. They they were an outstanding football team, you know. And you had, you know, he probably brought the best out of David Zrilic, who, you know, I think before that was a right fullback or right wing back. You know, it wasn't anything spectacular, but went there and scored scored goals for fun for him. Um, mm. But he had a great great sort of squad there with even Ante Moric and you know players like that, and even um, Teza Milicic. Um, mm. You know, the, the, the full squad and their back line was strong. Popper, mm. uh, uh, oh, I forget his name, the big boy at the back. Um, oh, Croatians are all big boys. Um, <laughs> sorry? Yeah, the likes of Rudin and, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah we had all these, these guys that were just outstanding. Yeah. You know, they were strong, but they could play as well. Um, Kupasek, that's what I'm thinking of, Kupasek. Uh, you know, Kupasek, just yeah. a beast, you know. Just, you know, to beat him, you, you had to be <laughs> you had to be doing something right. Yeah. Um, you know, guys like that, they, they were just a great squad. And and he always had teams playing football, and that's how we wanted us to play. And mm. we had the players to do it, and we did. And we we smashed every team. And we ended up losing to teams like, no disrespect to them, but, you know, your Carlton mm. in the semi where, you know, they they were just a rock-solid team. They weren't, they weren't an outstanding football team, but they went on to make the final. Um, I think the following year, we actually got knocked out by South Melbourne. Again, they were... I think on that day, I think we probably didn't play to our best mm. and they beat us. And both games down at Olympic Park in Melbourne, which probably didn't help us as well. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that team deserved 
definitely to be champions one year. We, I mean, the year that Wollongong won it, we smashed them 4-0 down at, down at Olympia yeah. at, at Wollongong. And I scored a hat-trick that night. And it was, you know, we were, we were by far the best team in that, in that comp, but didn't win at the mm. end of the day. I guess that's how mm. you judged. Um, but then I think that led to that year when Olympic did win it because we were growing into that. And, yep. you know, uh, that following year, they Actually, that team probably didn't deserve to win it, but they won it. Um, mm. And it was, it was, it was, it was one of those football things, right? So things happen for a reason, and that's that built up to that winning winning team. Uh, I think it was ninety uh, two thousand and one to something like that. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. You, you um, fr- from Olympic, uh, you get an, another call overseas. So h- how did that um, transpire? Well, it was kind of like it, a. It was it was a it was a double edged sword because I had I had an opportunity to go to Belgium, okay. and it was just being delayed and delayed and delayed, and I didn't want to wait till you know your, your next transfer window, and I wanted to go in the off season, um, and and it was kind of like yeah, it was, I was been doing well, but this Belgium opportunity just wouldn't happen. It just kept being delayed for some reason, out of our control, out of the agent's control. And it was just like, yeah, yeah, yeah we're going to sign in. We just have to wait. We just have to wait. And I don't know. I, honestly, I don't recall what the deal, the reasons were, but it just kept being pushed back. And then uh, got to- asked if I wanted to go and play in Greece um, on the <laughs> on the uh, probably couple two weeks before the comp started uh, in Greece. And I was like, oh, look, what team is it? And they, they said there were a feeder club for. Um, uh, what's the team called? Offy, Offy of Creek. So they'll feed a club to them. And I said, "Look, I'll only go there if they, if you can guarantee me that's going to be my next step. That I'm only here just for this period, just to to get in the next window." Yeah, yeah. Look, they're interested in you too, but they've got back then it was only three foreigners, um, and they were trying to offload a player from from somewhere in Europe, and he wouldn't leave. He had another two years. He said, "I'm staying here. I'm going to just earn my money and." Unless you pay me out, I'm not going. So they didn't pay him out. He didn't end up leaving. I, I ended up deciding, okay, well, I'll go to this club anyway. Um, I, I land in Greece. I'm, I'm there a week. I get a call from that agent. says, oh, the Belgian team's ready now. I'm like, I'm in Athens, dude. I, I've just signed. I can't. And he's like, oh, you know, I told you to wait. And So, yeah, anyway, that was another story. But um, it was kind of like a, I had all I had to do was wait another week or two, mm. two weeks. Um, but I was just getting itchy feet and I just wanted to go. And then they were going to Athenakos. Mm. Probably a silly move, um, mm. but it was an opportunity and I don't regret going at the end of the day, but I think, yeah, probably probably should have waited, but went there and enjoyed it. Um, got to play against AEC, got to play against, you know, your, your big clubs of Greece, mm. got to live in Greece. Um, unfortunately, it was a time when, it was Sydney 2000, so <laughs> missed out in the Olympics down here. Um, so I didn't get to live that, but um, it was football. And, um, and yeah, it was, it was probably not the highlight of my career, but, you know, ended up uh, going and, and ended up coming back again. <laughs> so um, you, you, uh, you also get a, a look in uh, to the, the national team. So in and out of uh, camp. So, Talk to me about how what that experience was like um, to to be selected in in the various camps uh, for for the national team. Yeah, look, I mean, I think a lot of people at the time were were saying I should have got a lot earlier, um, and and I kind of agree. I never got called out for any of the junior setups, even though I was always scoring. I was always, you know, one of the sort of standouts supposedly, um, and never got a got a run in the seventeens or twenties or. 23s mm. or any of that um and yeah and then it was basically because they just couldn't say no any longer you know i was always scoring i was always in the headlines i was always doing something um and it was thanks to that and branco's push you know branco kept kept bringing frank and frank farina and saying listen you know you've got to give him a go and mm. there was a tournament here against brazil i think it was here in in mm. sydney and um and i think the team in the first game struggled a bit and they said okay get meet us at the airport tomorrow we're going to we're going to melbourne and that's where i went 
And so uh, what's that like being in camp and, uh, you know, getting the, all the uniforms and then um, eventually lining up, um, you know, getting on the pitch? So what was that like? Oh, look, it's, it's, to me, it's the pinnacle of any player. Um, there's nothing, there's nothing greater, um, to be selected for the national team. Um, I think, uh, at the time there was a lot of really outstanding, um, established players already in that squad, you know, Viduka, mm. um, you know, just to name one, <laughs> you don't need to go any further. Um, and, and it was just to walk into that or well, to walk into the airport. These guys are all there. A lot of the boys are ex Sydney boys. So the, you know, the Carters and all that are like, um, oh, oh. I haven't seen you in a while, you know, because mm-hmm. they're all, you know, living and living it up in Europe. Um, and and yeah, it was it was good to join that that squad, um, and just surreal. Um, mm. Probably kind of like one of those, you know, pat on the back moment. You you you've all that hard work that you've done way back when you were eleven at that park on the wall. Um, mm. It's it's come out today. So mm. yeah, so you get there, you get to that, you walk on, get that jersey, you get that training training strip, you go out mm. in amongst all the the best of the best. Mm. Um, and at the time, I, I feel it was the best of the best um, for that era. Mm. Um, you know, no, again, no disrespect to nowadays, but it feels like here's a jersey, here's a jersey, here's a jersey, here's a jersey. And it, it's not. You, you don't. It doesn't seem like you you have to. You know, absolutely kill it for year after year after mm-hmm. year to mm-hmm. get one. Um, it's it's kind of like, oh, you've had five games, you're great. Here you go. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's. I feel like again, it's different era, different. I guess different strategies, but um, it, it feels like that was it was so hard to break into the national team back in those days, mm-hmm. um, and to break into arguably what was one of the best eras. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It was it was it was very rewarding. The, um, and, uh, yeah, so, and you also uh, you bagged the goal against, uh, I think it was Solomon Islands. So you, you got a, yeah, so. Uh, ended, up, ended up being an Oceanian champion. <laughs> um, so that was, that was kind of like being the Asian champion, I guess. It's, mm. it's no different. I mean, you know, they say that Asia is a lot tougher, um, maybe. <laughs> um, there's some really bad games. Um, but then, obviously, they got to play Japan and, in Korea, mm. which are mm. probably the two toughest ones currently. Um, mm. Back then, probably only really had New Zealand. Mm. Um, but other than that, I think it's same, same. Um, mm. And, yeah, but got to play a couple of games there and, and you know, we're not bad place to have a tournament in Tahiti. Where you, <laughs> you know, it stayed in Tahiti to play a, for your national team. And, yeah, got a, got a goal, got a couple of games. And, yeah, it was it was brilliant. It was, it was great honor. It was, it was a great, 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 great uh, privilege as a as a football. You uh, you you, uh, you uh, spend some time at at um, Northern Spirit. I think it was a season in Northern Spirit, then uh, Parramatta Power. So talk talk to me about so why Northern Spirit and then uh, Parramatta Power. So I think um, at the time Olympic was there was a few issues in the back background and you know being olympic there's always issues somewhere um there there was an issues there's a couple of issues behind the play and a lot of people just said oh you went for the money you went for this and it was never that it was always i my morals were different to to other people and i just said if if those people are around i can't be around and they're like oh we'll get rid of them and i was like no that's not me um if they walk by themselves i'll stay if they're not i'm leaving um and it was basically it was just that um and i and it was Olympic at the time. Um, Northern Spirit at the time had Mick Hickman, ironically, who gave me my debut mm-hmm. um, in the NSL. And I was like, well, you know, he's at Northern Spirit. I knew at the time the team wasn't going to be um, great. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, it, it was it was something I just had to do. Mm-hmm. And, but then, again, you know, I'd, I'd, personally, it was a good year for me. 14 goals um, in 20 games or something like that. And we didn't make the six again, but mm-hmm. you know, again, you know, a lot of a lot of guys are judged by by what they do, and I think I did did my job, but mm. unfortunately, we didn't have the uh, probably the uh, the squad to to make the challenge for the top top honors. Um, I had a two year deal there, and and I could have stayed on another year, um, 
but it was just one of those where it it wouldn't have been worth uh, my footballing uh, character to stay. And there was, a, again, Northern Spirit, as everyone knows, went into a few issues the following year, um, mm. financially in particular. So I was lucky I did leave. And then um, and Nick Theodora Cobblers came calling. So that was that was um, that was pretty good. Um, Paramount of Power was trying to develop into something, and we we had a pretty good squad there. And 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 I think we did make the the six and and challenged and yeah and we really really pushed the the more established clubs up um, and and probably could have gone a bit further, um, but didn't. But yeah, Paramount of Power was was good good at the time as well and it was you know but another coach that they like to play good football and um and yeah it was it was really great to to be to be involved with nick for, for a season as well so the um and I, I take it that the these individuals that were involved at sydney olympic um a, a change so it's, it's your third uh, your third time back at the club um and you spend uh a season there is 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 that right? And another season at Olympic. Yeah, well, that was the last year of the NSL, so mm. it was more. It was more that uh, it was somewhere where I wanted to at least, being that that was last year of the NSL, I wanted to finish it at the club that had started it all. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was it was something where um, I felt like if I did enough enough to get me an A League gig, it, it would have and mm-hmm. probably should have. Um, it was probably my lowest goal, goal scoring season as well. I only ended up on nine, um, and it was probably that that didn't get me a, a gig straight up. And um, but having said that, you know, history would would show that I probably should have. Um, mm-hmm. But having said that, it's again that's football, and what do you do? You move on. Um, it's it's it was one of those. But you know, again, it was mainly for that reason I went back there. It was just to. Knowing that it was the last year of the NSL, and I wanted to finish at the club where where it all started. You tried uh, once the NSL uh, finished. You tried to keep busy by um, you spent some time in New Zealand. Is that is that where you went after? Um... Yeah, because we had winters and summer seasons, so mm. we had obviously the NSL. Then you played state league here, um, finished that, and then there was nothing in between. So we, my brother and I, got a call up from a guy in New Zealand. Said, "Do you want to come and play for?" Why Tackery? And we were just like, well, there's nothing else happening at the moment. We're not getting what we deserve here in the A-League. And, and it was kind of like, okay, let's let's give it a go. Why not? Um, at the time, we didn't have any real anything else, responsibilities back here to do to stay. So off we trotted. And, yeah, it was it was different. It was a National League. Um, mm. Sadly, sadly now, um, that National League is... Is more respected in Asia than than in the Premier Leagues here in New South Wales and Victoria, and that when mm. a player can sign in any of the the Malaysia or Indonesia or that directly from that um, their national local national league, but you can't mm. from our no, local Premier Leagues. Mm. Um, the levels are probably better here in the NPL one and in Victoria and New South Wales probably quite comfortably um, mm. uh, for the top teams in particular. Um, yeah, so it was. It's strange that it's like that, but in, but yeah, no. But at the time, it was it was a move. <laughs> mm. It wasn't the greatest, but it was it was a move to to keep playing, to keep ticking over. And so you try and uh, keep busy to to reinsert yourself into the the, the A League now, and uh, you circle back and you spend some time. Uh, In uh, first in Sydney and, and then later in in Melbourne. So talk to me about um, that rationale and and what was the quality like playing for those uh, those teams and and what did you notice when you were playing against maybe when you'd come across uh, an A League team in either a friendly or a cup game etc. Hmm. Yeah, look, I mean it was. I think at the time, a lot of um, ex-NSL boys were coming back and playing Premier Leagues. So a lot of 
you know, the bigger teams had, you know, you guys that were just finishing playing 50, 150 NSL games. So the, the calibre and the quality of the MPO one here in Sydney and in Victoria was was brilliant. Um, there was it was it was talent everywhere. Um, you know, at Sydney United, we had you know myself, Troy Halp, and you know, Auntie Yurich, uh, Lebanon Halidi. Yeah, it was it was a lot of players who were who were of good caliber, and mm-hmm. that was just our team. Then the other teams also had players like that. Um, in Victoria. I went to the first team I went to was Oakley Cannons, and um, in our team we had Butzianis, um, Panopoulos, uh, um, Damianos. You know, you, you guys. Uh, we had uh, the Bachelor himself, um, Michael Turnbull. Mm. Um, you know, it, it, we had we had some talented players in, in those teams, and and the mm. ones we played against, um, Anthony Pelican. Uh, you know, guys like that. It was just brilliant. Um, Sala Massey was at, at, at Oakley, um, Fijian captain, and one of the one of the best strikers of, of the late NSL era. Mm. Um, it was, you know, it was it was brilliant. It was, the standard was high. Um, mm. And when I was in at Oakley, we played against uh, Melbourne Victory. Um, I think we lost four three to them in a game. I got two goals disallowed for some unknown, unknown reasons. Mm. Um, but it, you know, we we weren't. You know, it was like they. It, there was no real difference in, mm-hmm. in terms of ability. It was just that they were full-time mm. and we were part-time because we were Premier League. So, mm. you know, it's that whole, you know, every excuse under the sun that they throw at players nowadays that, oh, yeah, he's great, but he only trains three days a week. So he's not he's not fit enough to play. Get him fit and, and he can come play for the A-League. No. If he's got the ability, all he needs to do is your pre-season. You'll be right. Um, but they don't see it that way. <laughs> mm. um, but, yeah, no, there was no rule difference in my opinion um, we we played a, a few years later I was at Green Gully and we played again we played Melbourne Victory and we drew one all um, mm. and you know I think they only had like Archie Thompson um, Vargas and one one or two others out that weren't really mm. that were regulars that were the, their big names but the rest of the squad was there um, and we were one year up <laughs> and so we you know the, the, um, the standard wasn't too different because it was mm. a lot of boys particularly the first few years of the a-league was a lot of some some ex-nsl players mm. and a lot of unknown players who came from from who knows where mm. um that were coming into the a-league and we were we weren't any any worse we were just a lot of us weren't given the opportunity probably that deserved that a lot mm. of them deserved so um you uh Played at many, many NSL games, obviously got to represent our country. Um, what advice do you have to the sort of 15, 16, 17 year old um, boy or girl wanting to sort of make that, that next uh, leap? What, what words of advice do you have for them? Um, never give up. Never give up. Um, it's a dream, and, it's, and it's, if you can reach it, it's, it's the best dream to, to fulfill. To be a full-time professional footballer, there's nothing better. Um, if you can, keep chasing it, but work at it. Um, like I said earlier, you know, from my 11, age 11, 12, 13, all that hard work from those days is got got me the success that I did. May not have been as successful as Mark Baduka and, and, you know, your Mark Schwartz's and, and all those, but... If, we all have different levels of success and, and what we all gauge our own success at. And I, mm. um, yeah, I didn't get to play in the English Premier League or La Liga where I probably would have wanted to play, mm. but, um, but not everyone does. And, you know, there's for every one of me, there's, you know, 10,000 of, of me in, in, on a corner street in Argentina, mm. you know, and, and it's something that you need to work twice as hard as the next guy or girl to make it, to, to become that next footballer or the, the best you can be because a lot of the times it's not you're not given the opportunity and it's not because you're not good enough it's because of some people's opinion and yeah. and usually and I, I know for my sake a lot of it was wrong um but you need to work hard you need yeah. to train you need to do those extras because a lot of days now a lot of times now a lot of clubs now don't let you do that extra and you, you need to yeah. i mean you know your, your messies don't become freaks by, by not taking a free kick at training they 
they're hitting free kicks over and over and over. It's repetition. Mm. I didn't work, you know, good technique and good shooting and good ability of taking free kicks and and that because I just rocked up. No, it was, yeah, I had my training with my club, but then I'd be at the park another day on my own um, or a couple of days. Um, you know, I remember even as a kid, probably should have touched my back then. You know, I'd play on a Saturday, but Sunday morning I'd be at the park again mm. and with the old man hitting hitting, hitting the ball, not running, mm. you know, not, not doing 10K runs, but working on that technique, working on that finishing. It, it's something that you need to have that pride in what how you finish, how you do things. And I feel that that's something that's lost in a lot of people nowadays. It's just, oh, yeah, that'll do. Oh, mm. that's enough. But to make it to that next echelon of player, you need more. Great words of wisdom, Pablo Cardoso. Thank you very much for your contribution to Australian football and uh, having this conversation. Ah, my pleasure, anytime. Brilliant. Hey, guys. We've come to the end of this episode. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to our wonderful guest. If you like this type of content and would like to see more, how about you hit the like and subscribe button? and have a fantastic day.